welcome to another episode of the Double Tap podcast. Today, we're very excited to be joined by Mabel, the Chief Revenue Officer at Find Satoshi Labs, who are currently building or operating uh, Gas Hero. Hello, Mabel. How are you? Hey, how are you? I'm doing very well. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Um, quick disclaimers out the way. Uh, this content is for informational and educational purposes only. It is not for financial advice. The views shared by Alex and I are our own, and we may or may not have investments in some of the projects or assets mentioned. Um, let's get cracking. Mabel, something we'd like to ask all of our guests. What games are you currently playing? Myself. Gas here itself. Um, I'm not a typical gamer. I would actually explain um, as like upfront. Um, I'm not really good at things like, you know, overcooked because I usually will throw the food into <laughs> like the deep abyss or whatever. Um, I personally am interested in all things strategy. So I think Gas Hero itself is like a perfect thing for me because I definitely spend a lot of time um, you know, thinking about like the micro micro game theories and big game theories inside a thing, and how can I progress in that world? I can expand that later, but um, it's definitely not a show. Okay, awesome. Um, it's great that you bring up game theory. That was actually one of the things that we wanted to hit upon uh, most here. <laughs> so maybe we could just get right into it. Um, so sure. kind of first off, maybe high level. Uh, you know, how do you guys think about? building for player motivations in Web3. You know, this is something that you've talked a little bit about, posted on Twitter um, mm -hmm. and some of the other kind of source material. Yeah, so I think Web3 is always about incentive alignment. You'll hear this core concept. I'll bring it up probably many, many times today. Um, in terms of incentive alignment, it's really that, like, how do you leverage the right amount of rewards to really get people to do things that you wish them to do. And then in the larger structure, they play a role in your ecosystem. And then there's probably multiple types of goals that um, you don't want them to achieve, depends on who um, you are trying to use incentive to encourage with. So going back to your question about the, the, the user motivation, I actually wanted to touch upon like a trend that at least like we were experiencing. So I think back in the days when Axe Infinity or Step In um, was very popular. People were amazed by the fact that, oh, if you do some sort of behavior, either it's like clicking through the axes or if you are like just running or, or moving, you can get incentive. I think at that time, um, a lot of people were still kind of more amazed by the idea of you could do a certain behavior that's even like repetitive and then you would be able to earn, right? That's the kind of a first generation of Web3 games whatsoever, even if people are challenging, like, you know, there's not really much playability. Although I personally would still use Steppen, um, which is the product we built initially um, by Find Satoshi Lab, it's because like, you would have the externality, right? So um, I think now with the second generation of the Web3 games, I think the core thing is that the better you play, the, the better, the more you get rewarded. It's not just based on the repetitive behavior, but rather um, how much thought you have put into it in terms of skill, not even necessarily like, you know, how fast you can click or whatever, obviously those would matter, but definitely the skill based, the, the luck based, and then, you know, there's multiple multiplication factors um, into like how you would get rewarded. I think that's probably a big difference between the gen one and gen two. Um, and I also mentioned about externality, right? In step in, people are getting rewarded. Surely they are they're they're like moving and stuff, and then they're getting the the money. But I think another thing they're getting is also that they um, force themselves into a routine of exercising, and that's the externality that you're getting, right? Um, in Gas Hero, I think people um, they were rewarded by how well they play, but more importantly, it's a social and strategy game. What that means is that they actually enjoy the process of interacting with other people, even like acting, right? Like if you were trying to um, game theory with other people, like you might be acting a little bit. And that's actually the fun. That's the fun that the reason I like this is like probably a little bit similar to LARP. Like you have to act in a way or like, you know, perform in a way that um, it suits you the best to get to what you want in, in terms of the goal. 
Um, so I think the the motivation at the end it's really that users were trying, um, progressing in the game, but they're getting in addition to the rewards, they're also getting other sense of an excitement, including the social and strategy part of it. So it sounds like one of the the primary things that that you think through is some of this like emergent behavior that you can kind of induce people to perform based on the game design. So one of the, I think more recent posts that you've had, you've talked about these like different kind of human desires, such as like power, glory, wealth, it could be misremembering, but it's, it's correct. Okay, perfect. Uh, my notes served me well. Um, so yeah, can, you, can you talk a little bit about like these, these different archetypes in your posts? This is something that Jacqueline and I love to talk about, right? Who are the different gamers? How are you designing different loops for the different gamers? And then how do you kind of bring that together to create this single kind of cohesive experience that, um, you know, again, induces some of that emergent behavior? Sure. Um, I actually, in that post, I was thinking whether I should even explain the behavior loop of those, but I thought like it might be a too redundant. So I didn't write that, that in. I'm glad that you actually asked. Um, so this game itself, maybe I would start with the structure, the social structure of the game, and then it will be helping a lot when it comes to explaining through power, glory, and wealth. So it starts with a tree-like structure. It's a nine multiplies by nine multiplies by nine and multiplies by whatever number. I'll explain what it means. In each base, um, like one person is one base, right? You have a base construction vehicle. And you'll have nine people in a clan and then nine clans in the guild, nine guilds in a district. And then in one city, um, by default, you only have two districts, but you, you can expand if you were able to recruit more than 80% of the population into the two districts. You as a mayor, if you're a mayor, you'll be able to expand to another district and then further develop. And on the world level, um, there's in total 175 at max, but right now we only have 15 cities. So that is a um, tree-like structure that people are in. Why we call it a so tree-like social structure is because naturally when you go into the, the world, you will have a neighbor. Um, that's the other eight players inside a clan. I would even say that in a clan and a guild, um, like the people that either is like nine people or 81 people would be the closest social circle that you would be interacting with, right? So that's kind of, and, and then on the higher level, it becomes more like the people who you are know of, but then you don't really interact as much. So after explaining this uh, structure, I think it would help a lot when it comes to ex explaining how people are uh, um, fulfilling these desires. So in each clan um, and each level of the, the power structure, right, there will be a leader. How do you get to the leader position? That becomes very interesting. So for clan leader and guild leader, um, we call clan chief and guild master, they would have to be strong enough in battles and then just say like you fight against the, the clan boss and become the clan leader. And same thing for, for guild master, you'll have to fight with other clan leaders to become the strongest one. So that's the minimum kind of requirement. However, once you progress to the guild level or above, it's no longer just about a power because otherwise like, you'll just pay as much as possible and then try to be very strong, right? Um, then it would have a voting side of things. And um, you'll actually also try to make sure that people would, like each person will only have one vote. We don't use GMT to vote. It's just like in-game vote. Um, so like you would have at, like, as much as possible support from the people in your city in order to, to get there, um, to become a city mayor. But why do people want to become a city mayor? It's because at an even higher level that um, there are seven world elders. These people are collecting tax from the whole world's GDP. And then they also have like strong power, such as like whether deciding there's, um, they, they want to reset the world or not, like restarting a new season. So such powerful um, kind of uh, power structure allows people to really you know, go through um, at least like you have like a certain level of uh, to, to be able to fight. But then like next step, it's like you have to social with other people, make sure they recognize you and why people are really interested in becoming leaders. Right. It's because like we share four percent of the GDP of the tax um, with all of these leaders. So if you're in a nine people's clan, then you're sharing nine people's tax divided by five because like you have five different structure. Right. Same thing. Guild master, 81 people. District, you have 
more than that. And then city, if you can keep expanding that, like the city can have like as much as like 10K people or whatever, and then you'll be sharing the tax from that. So that's, that, that's the power round. The glory round, exactly opposite. Like you don't want to social with other people. Um, you, you want actually to just fight based on your skills, your understanding of your, the troops, you know, the combination of the weapons and, and the pets and also the, you know, the heroes, like there are 48 of them. You actually could become one of the top performer in gas war. For gas war, what is this? Is that there's individual, there's clan war, there's also guild war. Um, you can fight as an individual and become very strong. You don't have to talk to anyone. You, 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 yeah, technically. And then you just focus on the gameplay and then have a best troop, which is a line, line um, the, the six heroes lineup. Or maybe like you try to work together with your other clan members and make your clan very powerful. And then you can kind of fight against the other ones and then become the world champion or maybe top 15 or whatever. Or even the guild. Guild level, it's like the whole guild has to be very strong, um, relatively even in terms of strength. And then you fight with other guilds and then become like very powerful and win something. So for gas war, the gas war is like what we call glory because like you're fighting for your own personal um, clan or, or guilds glory. But that reward or why people are interested in fighting those is because the proceeds that the, sorry, the rewards of the proceeds coming from the, the, the auction house proceeds. So that's how we are doing, like I said earlier, how we are doing incentive alignment through these two. And um, I think it's quite important to mention about wealth. Wealth at the end, I think um, people would be much easier understanding. There's a lot of people who are producing the resources necessary in, um, as the foundation of the society. People who are fighting for the glory side of things, or maybe they're trying to grow their city, they need more resources to, to expand. And that is, such, that is such a requirement for the resources. And that is why people would be interested in providing these um, supply to the real demand coming from the glory side of things and also the, wealth, um, the, the power side of things. And that's how wealth becomes. It's more, I, I guess like you can call it a liquidity provider in some, to some extent. Um, but that these three, it's almost like a, I wouldn't call it an impossible triangle, but it's kind of that way because like you only have to, you only could achieve one side of the things. Um, if you are trying to like work on the game and then you know choose a path to progress so yeah it feels to me like gas hero is also a game where a large proportion of the player base if not the majority could be in one way or another classified as like whales um and i'm curious how you compare or what your thought process has been when comparing like traditional web two whales that are like purely focused on on um, this idea of like power and recognition as opposed to like a web three whale who there's that wealth element in there so i actually might disagree with what you're saying in terms of like um it's largely catered to the whales because as a game that's or we call ourselves a social assimilation it's like a simulation to a real society, right? Only the only difference is that it's expedited. Like every single um circle cycle is like 30 days and what whatnot. So I think a big difference is that we always think of ourselves as a hope based game. That's very important. Because today I think this world everyone would probably agree that we lack of social mobility. There's very little chance for people to actually have the experience of breaking their hum the social hierarchy, and then become, you know, having some sort of hope that they can always have some sort of progression in their life track. Gasio is providing that. We are not trying to provide excessive ROI or, you know, investment type of things. It's rewarding the people the longer you play inside this game or the simulation. Um, and then the more, I guess, like, you know, um, thoughts that you have put into the game, whether that being like you, you try to liaise with other people or coordinate with, you know, other group related stuff, the better you will be rewarded. That is the kind of experience that we are trying to provide. So I want to go back to your question about whales, because I, I do think that is a important question as well, right? I wasn't trying to deny that we do have a lot of whales inside this game. I'm just saying it's a very diverse ecosystem. So for the whales, like these people are the economic 
kind of support for the the glory side of things. They're chasing glory, or maybe like they're just trying to become leader. And then, like in order to become leader, you have to have at least some sort of foundation to get to the guild level, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think these people are here because、um, they believe that every single step of progression can actually be translated into something with the with the price tag. I think that is vastly different from、um, the the Web two whale experience where you spend a lot, but then what all you get was that you get to have. Um, some sort of like you know leading experience, and I think that also can play an interesting part of it because if you are trying to guide people, some people would use their you know coordination, the kind of a PM skill, right, product manager skill, or some people would just say like I would fairly um distribute what I have for um from all of these gas war or maybe like the leadership position income so that you guys can stick with us because one thing I think about this game. Um, like trying to kind of prevent whale being too strong is that it's just like what what we design with the clan war or the guild war, right? If you are just one person and very strong, you can't really beat other guilds because like it, it's not like you can just kill everyone, every um sorry, every other eighty one people um in the other guild and then win. Like a lot of these rules inside this game is based on check and balance. Like we want to make sure that、um, while the whales. They are enjoying the kind of experience that they、um, should get from spending.、Um, the other, the others can also survive very well. So I guess that's what I would say about、um, the whole ecosystem. So maybe like pulling it one one level back up.、Um, you know, anybody that's familiar with Step In、um, can immediately kind of. Recognize and appreciate the stark contrast between kind of the game design of Step In and the game design of Gas Hero. I'm curious, what was the driving force behind that? Is it, hey, at Fine Satoshi Labs, we want to build out kind of a a nice portfolio of different entries that touch upon different types of gamers that again create different emergent behaviors, or、um, was it was it something else?、Um, just really curious because it seems like they're they're pretty different. Yeah, yeah, a lot of those. If you're referring to just the economic、um, difference, right? Nothing, nothing about because like the product itself is is very, very different.、Um, Stepin is not even a game. I would say it's more of a lifestyle app where you provide incentive. So I think a few things, right?、Um, we do realize that from Stepin's design,、um, it's great that people would get that incentive from、uh, like com- other people coming in. But at the same time, there's the problem of Like you, you definitely have like a tap in terms of the growth, right? Like you can't always perpetually grow. So this is also why we brought in this idea of incentive alignment, where people are spending money inside Gas Hero, and they can everyone who contributed can also share from that pool. That is a huge difference between、um, Step In and Gas Hero fundamentally. I wanted to、um, shift the conversation a little bit over to. Uh, monetization for anyone not familiar with Gas Hero, I think at the time of recording this, it costs like 500 GMT to join the game, which is like roughly 150 dollars. Which I think, taken from a, a traditional mobile like idle battler perspective, 150 dollars is like a lot for a player to spend.、Um, and also, a lot of the Um, sort of mechanism design gameplay loops within the、uh, within the app itself are they do a lot to incentivize participation and the majority of that participation is related to like trading activity. I'm curious on like what the thought process was、um, with designing the monetization largely around like encouraging、um, in-app spend. Yeah, so I think like in-app spend is a very、um, traditional gaming term. Like when we are saying spending, I think people were probably expecting they're exchanging the dollar with the experience that they're getting. But like I just mentioned, right inside this social simulation, you are not literally just spending the one fifty dollar plus, like you buying the heroes and stuff, just to experience something. I don't think that's the case. So I think to some extent, Gas Hero, I would consider it as a lifestyle lifestyle app as well because, like, I'll again use that retail experience. You start with three heroes and stuff. 
your expectation. I'm talking about inside um, the in-game asset term, not the GMT term. Um, is that you would be able to have reproduced another same lineup after, before the that lifespan of the hero dies, and then you can have additional productive asset to continue working on things and experiencing things. So I think I would not accurately describe this as a spending because they would also. I guess like you can call it spending, but in the sense of they would expect certain level of continuation and they can just keep building on that. So the kind of experience that they are getting is not just the thrilling experience that you are getting from a traditional gaming um, uh, like experience. Because like technically in World of Warcraft, you spend something or maybe some other, even like uh, the, 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 the Hearthstone and stuff, you spend that money 100% taken by the game studio. Here, majority of the money actually people spend goes back to the users, the incentive alignment. Um, and that's what I was saying about that. And I, from our standpoint, um, we would even offer a opportunity for certain world elders, if they are at their position, they said, okay, we think out of the 50% of the auction house proceeds, you take 25% is too much. Can, can we actually maybe modify it to 20%? And then like the other 25% burn, they also think maybe like they burn too much. Maybe we can discuss like what, how to adjust that. A lot of those can actually be discussed and determined by people who are playing in the game. I think that's actually vastly different from the experience that people are looking for inside a traditional game. Because um, if you play well in a PvP war in a traditional game, I think not very likely you're going to get the money back. But if you build up your troop and actually become the world champion, there's a high chance that that reward, because other people were also spending inside, can fully cover whatever you spend. And then you can even make a little bit more than that. So I think that would be um, a big kind of component that I would um, emphasize on. I wanted to quickly double tap on the point about aligned incentives, because um, mm. I found this really fascinating how... Uh, players within the game, or at least winning players within the game, are actually making more than the developer themselves. Like you guys take a minority <laughs> stake. Um, I'm, is this a like a philosophical decision being within Web three? Is there a sense that you think if you grow the pie larger for everyone, that you guys will end up making more money, or um, is there something else behind this decision? I think it, it's necessary, right? Because the entry barrier is so high, to your point, like the price and everything. Um, people definitely need the hope. Again, it's a hope-based game. The large price pool is for everyone to share because we do believe that. I mean, in traditional game, like you also have this CPI concept, right? Like you spend, especially for SLGs, like you spend um, quite a bit for to acquire a user. And it can go as high as like, I don't know, $100 or $150 per person to acquire a new user. But these people spend so much. But the thing is, I think in Web3 uh, games and whatsoever, it's quite important to allow the users to, to acquire themselves based on incentive. Um, so I think at the end, first of all, of course, it's growing the pie kind of thing. But at the same time, I think um, if there is a high GDP, there is a good circulation of the economy. Um, it's beneficial for everyone. And then also, in addition, this game has a huge deflationary force to GMT, which is like a fundamental supporting force of our ecosystem. So it's kind of like a one stone, two bird kind of thing. Um, I don't see why we have to earn more than the community. So the big question for me, and I, I'm not really expecting like a, uh, like, you know, a final answer, um because mm. everything is so new here but yeah. how do you believe that this model wins over the well-based freemium model uh typically seen in like web 2 i feel like um i kind of touch upon quite a bit on this um i think at least for now like we are launching at a time that is the again the, the world really lacks social mobility like people want it to have some sort of experience that's different from their real life they want new hope they want to hope at least like if i put in the effort i can progress in that experience i think that stand alone could attract a lot of people to participate but like that obviously is like highly related to 
the time that we are right now living in. And then I got I got a, another token question to follow that up. So clearly, <laughs> you've done an immense you've put an immense amount of time into designing the the in game economy for <clears throat> for gas here and figuring out ways where you can plug GMT into that game in a variety of different ways that it wasn't used in Stepin. Um, so what are maybe one or two of the other either um, you know game economies in Web three that you think are um, well designed? or any other types of token designs that you've looked to, um, maybe for inspiration or just that you were like, hey, that's pretty clever. Um, that's something that aligns incentives in a way that might be more mm -hmm. apt for your application. Um, so yeah, curious if there's any token designs that you're a fan of. Um, I think any, like the thing about crypto or generally Web3 or like, I guess you can also say blockchain, like it's like the interesting thing about that. It's not just about the tech or uh, tech or anything. It's actually about how you leverage the tokenized network to incentivize people's behavior. Um, I definitely think things like render things like uh, helium, they've done that. So those kind of model were something that we, I personally appreciate a lot. I'm curious, what's your opinion on why GMT has underperformed compared to other gaming tokens over the past like, three months or so? So I have to dis fully disclose that. Uh, so starting from March of last year all the way to uh, September last year, a lot of people were a lot of our private investors were selling. That's like 35% of the vested. And then um, starting from September all the way till sorry, uh, hold on, sorry, March to December and December to this December, uh, then December to this September, um, which is another nine months, it will be 30% of the token vested. It's vested monthly. Um, there's constant, there's definitely constant selling pressure from that. I would also say that we do not use any of um, like active market makers. Uh, we do have liquidity providers, but they're not doing anything like, you know, and then, um, so anything that you're seeing on the market that's trading is just like natural demand from people who wants to buy things from Stepin, like the, the shoe marketplace and also like, you know, inside Gas Hero. Um, we have calculated a number. Um, I think maybe Ico shared a model. I don't know with you guys. The If we reach 20K or 30K real users in the game, the deflation, the, the kind of burn would probably be equivalent to the monthly selling pressure um so i think that's that because like in inside step in you um in addition to people are just playing playing every day people can also mine the additional gmt right so that's like new emission so we're just netting the emission with the burn i think like at 20k 30k it should be the break even point it yeah. to your point it's a very new model like no one knows I don't know, it's great. the big problem for like not problem but challenge of this model is that when you enter, your ROI is not the best. It's probably like you're going to make up the principal and then you'll have maybe 15% or best case if you have a good lineup, if you know how to do it, 20% for someone who's purely PBE. So it's actually really that when you are doing the group adventure with other people, it's also PBE, but it's like a group PBE. And you're participating more gameplays inside a game, you, you discover higher, higher, higher ROI. But still, it's not going to be pretty aggressive it's going to be good like a normal sense um that was an intentional design but it's definitely against all of the game design that people currently have inside this market so we'll also see um whether this playability can attract people and the social part of thing can track people and that just about brings us to the end of this episode we had a good time talking about social dynamics, player motivations, and incentive alignment. I want to thank you very much, Mabel, for your time. It's been a pleasure. It's been a plus. Yeah, awesome. Well, I hope to speak again soon. Cool. The content of this video is intended for informational purposes only and should not be considered as investment advice. The views shared by Alex and I are our own, and we may hold investments in some of the companies or digital assets featured in the video.